Welcome back, everybody. As was promised in the last lecture, what we'll be doing today is exploring another very popular topic of conversation as social psychology was starting to form as a sort of branch of psychology, a topic called social influence. In today's class, we'll be looking at a lot of major terminology, big figures, and monumental studies that have been done to try to understand this topic that stretches into a lot of different areas. I don't want to give away too much in this first slide here, but just understand that much like our last class, we're not only going to understand some of the core concepts that relate to this specific area, so we have a better grasp of sort of the historical perspective of social psychology, but we'll also be looking at ways that we can apply a lot of this material to our own lives and hopefully get a better understanding of how in every situation we find ourselves in, social psychology is at play. And to really hit that moment home, what I always like to do when we're in an in-person class is ask individuals to do something kind of weird. I try to survey the class and ask them a fairly straightforward question. I ask them to imagine themselves in that photograph on the left, somewhere in the crowd. And I tell them to try to explain what it is that they would probably be doing if they were in the crowd in that specific event in the photograph on the left. Now, I don't usually give any more details than that because telling people what it is and what needs to be done sort of takes away from the fun of the activity. But after a little bit of awkward silence and people not being sure how to answer the question, I usually start to get responses like, well, you know, I'm, I'm there to listen to music. And then I say, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, what are you wearing? How are you behaving? How are you interacting with others? At this point, people start to give a little bit more information. They talk about how they're actually, when they're in that specific situation, usually dancing and singing along with the music and wearing comfortable clothes that will allow them to engage with others. They talk about talking with people around them, maybe taking out their cell phones and either recording or using it as a sort of pseudo lighter to make the experience a little bit more entertaining. And all of these things highlight what they sort of understand you would do at something like a concert. But then I ask people to do something a little different. I ask them to imagine themselves in the crowd in the picture on the right, asking them what it is that they would potentially do if they were sitting in that crowd. How would they behave? How would they interact with individuals? And a lot of the responses that are given are very different from the first set. People talk about being quiet, about only clapping when appropriate, about wearing very specific types of attire. And I ask them at the very end, what's the point of going to that second event? In which almost everybody replies, well, to listen to music. At that moment, we sort of see the odd pairing there. The fact that even though you're attending a concert in both situations, your behavior in those two events is very different. In fact, I propose that if you've ever attended something like a high school or a college football game, your behavior at those events might be more similar to your behavior at the first concert than what we see in the second concert, despite the fact that the goals, the aims, the definitions of what you're doing in those is theoretically very different. And all of this brings us back to what it is that we're going to cover in today's class. Not necessarily what's right in those specific situations, but instead, what leads us to do all the things we do and what allows us to know how to appropriately act when we find ourselves in a multitude of different social environments throughout our days. And all of this relates to a really important topic in social psychology called conformity, where we either mimic or simply change our behaviors due to the presence of others, be it real or imagined, so that we can sort of align with expectations that are being placed on us. And when we talk about what these expectations are, usually they're whittled down to these concepts called norms, the standards that are being placed usually on everybody within a specific situation. 
Now, there's a lot of different types of norms that exist, both in definition and in specific norms themselves. And if you were taking a social psych class, we'd talk about differences between implicit versus explicit norms and differences between injunctive norms versus pejorative norms. Lots of different ways we can go with that specific term, but at the heart of conformity for all of us in all of these different situations that we've talked about is this idea of conformity. Right? Norms are the things we're bending ourselves to. And that, of course, leads to the very obvious question, which is exactly where many social psychologists went almost a century ago. And that's what leads us to pursue these norms. Why do we find ourselves so drawn to behaving in a specific way when we find ourselves in a specific environment? And why, if we do buck those norms, we sort of identify it very clearly and maybe even label ourselves as somebody that doesn't follow those norms. What's the, the big push for humans to do this? Well, most researchers about a hundred years ago tried to answer this question by tapping into a bunch of other resources that existed in psychology before then. And one particular researcher that sort of became synonymous with early research on the topic of conformity was a gentleman named Musafer Sharif. In the 1930s, Sharif had identified a specific effect, this weird thing that was discovered actually by cognitive psychologists, something called the autokinetic effect. In this particular effect, what researchers would do is place people in a single individual room with no sources of light other than a light that was hanging from a ceiling. They'd suggest to these individuals that that light hanging from a ceiling, which was usually connected to something like a computerized arm or some type of cord, had the potential to move. And their job in the experiment was just to report to the researcher that would be with them in this room that was completely dark except for the light hanging from it, how much they saw the light move at different moments when they theoretically were going to activate it or move it. Some of you might have already guessed this, but in these studies, the researchers were never moving the light. It was all just mere suggestion. But because of the way these suggestions work, and because of how our eyes do tend to move around, just little bits and our perspective can get taken off if there's only one source of light, almost everybody in these studies, and we still would find this today, tended to see the light moving. And what was really interesting to Sharif was the fact that the amount of movement that people saw varied dramatically from person to person. Some individuals would see it just moving a tiny amount, you know, a centimeter, a half centimeter. If we're looking for our basic metrics that we use in the United States, you know, some people would see it moving a half inch to two inches, where others would see it moving a decent amount. Not necessarily flying all over the room, but definitely moving much more than the more conservative group. They'd see it on average moving, say, six inches, or if we're going back to centimeters, you know, five, six centimeters. It was not necessarily a huge, dramatic jump up, but it was one that was noticeable and one that was consistent for about a third of the people studied with this autokinetic effect research. Then there was this third group of people who weren't that common, but they were there that when they went in there, somehow were convinced that this light was flitting all over the room. You know, some would see it move upwards of about a foot or around 18, 16, whatever centimeters in the environment. And this consistent report of this moving around happened time and time again for many of these individuals. And this kind of separation, these three types of individuals, was exactly what Sharif tapped into to study conformity. What he would do in his study is place a triad of people, one who on their own had already seen it moving around a lot, one who had seen it moving a moderate amount, and one that had not seen it move much at all, in the same room together. He'd tell them that in this iteration of the study, 
they were to report how much it moved in succession. So one person would go, the next person would report, and the third person would report. And usually to, to help remove some of the weight from one person, he would switch up who would go first. And what Sharif found was pretty amazing. Even though most of these people stayed fairly consistent on their own, when they got together, they almost always started to merge in their reports of how much they saw the light moving. You see in the lower left-hand corner a chart of Sharif's of a triad that he put together. You see that by the fourth iteration of the study, these individuals were reporting lengths that were almost identical, and oftentimes once they got to that agreed-upon point, very rarely did people deviate from that. In fact, Sharif reported that when he put these people back on their own, very rarely did people deviate from the group's average that they'd sort of unknowingly come to. Now, people were very insistent, Sharif said, that they weren't reporting these distances because they were forced to or because they were talking with others. They said they truly believed that that's how much they saw it moving. Mind you, we have to remember that they were reporting just what they were imagining. There was no actual light moving. But Sharif contended that these results really highlighted what conformity is all about. He suggested that we don't conform because we're forced to, but because we find ourselves in lots of situations like the autokinetic effect every day, where there isn't necessarily a right response, or we just don't know how to do something. So what do we do? We look to others. We see what they're doing. We try to figure out what might be best for us, and then once we determine that, we quickly flock to it oftentimes assuming that we're doing it because we want to or because that's what we think is right in that specific situation. And you might, if you think back to those examples we have, sort of be able to tie some of your behaviors in those events to exactly what Sharif found in his study. You might remember being at a concert, looking around, trying to figure out, especially your first one, what everybody was doing and whether or not you should do something like that. You might remember attending a football game or a very fancy event like a concert or like, say, a, a, a big dinner. And in finding yourself in these new places, you might have leaned a lot on the resources of others to figure out what was appropriate, just assuming that what they were doing was probably the right thing. Well, Sharif's conclusions really resonated with a lot of people, and it stuck as the prime reason most people gave for why conformity was so common in almost every social situation we found ourselves in. And then a little later, not even a decade later, a researcher started to question these assumptions. This person asked a really interesting question. Well, if we're conforming because we don't know what the right thing to do is, what happens when people are asked to conform when there is a really right response? And people are being asked in this situation to provide a wrong response. This was exactly what Solomon Ashe asked in the 1950s, after kind of tinkering with this for over a decade, in his original what we call Ash line study. In this line study, Solomon Ash would bring in participants and ask them to judge which line, the test line, which you see pictured on the lower left-hand corner, was most similar to. Line one on the right, line two on the right, or line three on the right. And most of us just looking at this image can immediately identify that obviously the test line looks most like line two. But in his study, he did something kind of unique. After his individuals in this study were asked these questions on their own, they were then brought together with a group and asked to do pretty much the same thing. But instead of getting to report it, and well, just being in front of everybody, these participants had to report it after others gave their answers. And unbeknownst to these people, most of the people they were paired up, if not all the people they were paired up with in these studies, were what we call confederates, people that were kind of a part of the experiment. And they were told 
in this study, after getting a couple right, to start getting them wrong. But for everybody to get the question wrong in the exact same way. So after a few questions of which line some random test line was most like, they'd get to a point where, say, this picture popped up, and the first person in the study would say that that test line that you see in front of you was most like line one. And another person would say line one, and another, and another, and all the way down the line until it was the true participant's turn. Now, again, they didn't know they were the only true participant. They just thought they were participating in a study with others. But Ash wanted to see how this one person, after hearing all these wrong answers, would respond. And what he was able to find in his original 1950 study, and in many iterations of it later, was that about three quarters of the time the group was giving these wrong responses, some, at some point, the true participants would bend to the group. Not every time. In fact, it only happened about a third of the time overall. But three quarters of the group just couldn't resist the temptation, at least once, maybe multiple times, to go with the group and give a really really wrong response and one of the times that they gave a really, really wrong response. And this put everything that we thought of when it came to why we conform on its head. This was a very unambiguous situation where there was an obviously right answer to the question. There was no real punishment or incentive for these individuals not to give the right answer, yet they still conformed. Once Ash found this, he started trying to dissect this significantly more to really get at what was behind this conformity in his very famous line study. So what pushed these people to conform in this very famous Ash line study? Well, Ash contended that there were really one of two reasons for why people would bend to the group. He thought some of them were going with the group because they just didn't want to stick out. They didn't want to be the one that was getting weird looks by all of their fellow, what they thought were participants in the study. He also suggested that there were some that maybe did truly believe that they were seeing things incorrectly, that others might have had more knowledge of the situation or just a better angle that was causing them to not be able to understand where their incorrect responses were coming from. Now, Ash gave special names to these things, and they are still, to this day, sort of linked to some of the concepts that we usually use to explain these examples of conformity. Nowadays, we call people's bending to the group public compliance. When we don't necessarily believe what the group's doing, but we're going along with them nonetheless. The term that often gets tied to Ash, and is actually mentioned by him, is this idea of something called normative social influence. It's when we actually bend to others in a group simply because we're trying to be accepted by them. Um, sometimes we maybe do commit public compliance not because of this normative social influence where we're just wanting to be liked and fit in, but oftentimes there is sort of an overlap between these two ideas. Same thing goes for another term that was used to explain these behaviors and one that Ash used. When we're bending to a group because we believe what they're doing is probably right, this is often what we call private acceptance. Now, why we do this is often tied to the other term, informational social influence. We conform to others because we just have this sense that they know more or have better access to something than we do. So what else could have impacted conformity in this original Ash line study? This is a question that Ash himself asked, and he, as time progressed, tinkered with a lot of different nuances of his original experiment. And what he was able to find within his experiment was that there were actually a lot of factors embedded within his original design that seemed to create an uptick in conformity. One of the things that he was really focused on having in his first iterations of the study was a unanimous group giving the wrong answer before the true participant got to go. Over time, he started to ask, well, what happens if that group is not unanimous? What happens if the person participating in the study has something like what he called an ally? Uh, 
somebody who was giving the right answer instead of the wrong answer that everybody else was giving. Well, what Ash was able to show was that in all of these groups, regardless of their size, the amount of conformity that he saw from his participants dropped dramatically. The first, second, one person within the group sort of broke this unanimous bond that the group had. In groups of nine, as you can see pictured in the bottom corner here, with eight, again, Confederates, all of them giving the wrong answer, he found around 35% conformity. But when one of the Confederates within that group of eight gave the correct response before it was a true participant's turn, conformity dropped all the way from 35%-ish to around 10%, depending upon the different study he was looking at. And that drop was something that he consistently found, and others have consistently found, when individuals are faced with a situation where they're being asked to conform to a group, not agreeing, and having just one person sort of bucking that trend. All of this really spoke to some kind of critical features to a group if you were going to get somebody to conform when they didn't necessarily believe what the group was doing since when they were just committing that public compliance that we talked about before. Other researchers have also found subtle things that you can do to increase or decrease conformity in situations like the Ash Line study or any other one where people are being asked to bend to a group even if they don't necessarily agree with it. One of the things that seems to be a major factor in conformity and has also been proven to be a factor in the Ash Line study was a need for people to respond quickly and in front of other individuals. That push to give a fast response tends to lead people to much higher rates of conformity than if people are, say, given time or allowed to provide a response that's not in the immediate presence of other individuals. There are other iterations of the ASH study and other things that are similar to it that have also added wrinkles and found ways to dramatically increase even the conformity that ASH found. When people are told they need to participate in the study and that the group itself needs to come up with a unanimous response, most everybody in that condition tends to conform. It's one thing to break from a group and provide a different response. It's another thing to try to get the entire group to change their response when they seem to be indicating that they think they're correct. Another thing that seemed to matter in the Ash Line study was that if people were incentivized to give the correct response, offered a small monetary amount for every right response, levels of conformity did drop in that situation. But it's also important to note here that follow-up studies have shown that this incentivization can sort of be turned on its head when the correct response becomes more and more ambiguous. In essence, if you find yourself in a situation where you know the group is wrong, and you're getting paid for a correct answer, you're not very likely to bend to the group. But if you're not quite sure as to whether or not the group is wrong, and they're giving a wrong response, that ambiguity can lead you to actually increase your level of conformity in that situation. Probably getting into that level of private acceptance that we talked about earlier. Another factor that Ash found was really critical in getting people to bend to the majority was how many people were in that unanimous group. What he found in numerous studies, and others have replicated this, was that when people were paired with just one other individual who was giving an incorrect response before them, very few of them actually went with that other person. In fact, just a small uptick more than what people would do in terms of giving wrong responses on their own. And even when people were paired up with two individuals providing wrong responses before it was their turn, you only saw conformity at around 15-ish percent. But if that majority got up to something that Ash coined the magic number three, all of a sudden you saw conformity rising to pretty much its static level. Usually in most studies, he found around a third, give or take, of the participants when they were paired up with two other random people tended to go with, the, well, not a third of the people, but people tended to go with the group a third of the time. As you increase the size of the majority, there were small shifts in numbers, but most research of, researchers have contended that those shifts are really just noise in the data. You know, small, subtle changes from person to person 
but overall the, the effects seem to level out at about three individuals in the majority. Another thing that is noted here is that when people are paired up with people they know, it starts to have a small impact on individuals' performances. They're just a little bit more likely to conform with the members of what we call our in-group in comparison to our out-group. At least that's what Ash found in his original iterations of the study. But this brings us to a really important topic that we discussed in our last class. As people started to not just try to replicate this study in different generations and across different schools, and instead expanded to different cultures, different societies, what we found is that there were some critical components to this particular study that emerged within those groups that we didn't really see as much in our culture. We did recognize, as I mentioned just previously, that people did conform a little bit more to their friends than just random strangers. But when we went to these groups that we mentioned before called collectivist societies, East Asian, South Asian groups that were the main focus of a lot of early cultural research, what we found there was that the groups we were a part of, who we were paired up with, had much more of an impact on conformity levels. In those collectivist societies, in comparison to the individualist societies, people conformed significantly more to their in-group members than those in an individualist society. In essence, if you were from an East Asian culture and being tested in this in your school and you were paired up with classmates or people you respected, you're much more likely than just one in three times to bend to the group that you're paired up with. But if people were paired up with random strangers, people they didn't know, or people that maybe were considered uh, you know, lesser in, in terms of their understanding or comprehension or ability to answer these questions, all of a sudden in those societies, conformity levels plummeted much, much more than what we see in our individualist society when people are paired up with individuals that, again, are not seen as part of the in-group, but instead a part of what we would consider the out-group. And these findings have been replicated numerous times, suggesting that when we look at people's tendency <laughs> to conform, even if there is sort of an innate desire to fit in, like we talked about earlier with Sharif's research, there are other factors at play. Something akin to a learning experience that needs to take place and that helps us determine when we should conform and who we might be more inclined to conform to. And all of these things have added wrinkles to this very basic study that Ash ran over 70 years ago at this point. And it also led, if we're looking at the Ash Line study, to subsequent research on conformity that looked at this topic from different angles. One of the questions that started to pop up, um, actually a couple decades after the work of Solomon Ash, was whether or not we could conform in some situations, not by what we're doing, but by what we're not doing. This later was called the bystander effect. And we bend our sort of inactions in a situation where we probably should help due to this expectation by others, or the expectation that others, I guess, want us not to act. And the classic example that has highlighted the bystander effect and really spurned on a lot of research on this topic was a tragic case of a woman named Kinney Jenny Vesey. Now, if we were in an in-person class, I'd be pulling up a video right now detailing the unfortunately brutal slaying of this, specific, this woman uh, in New York a number of decades ago. Now, this video that we would watch would not only detail some of the events that transpired, but also some of the questions that started to be asked about the 40 or 50 individuals that saw her in a very busy New York night be brutally slain uh, in front of them. And the question that was asked after this occurred wasn't how could this happen in New York, because unfortunately lots of these types of things had happened. But instead, what were the factors behind this? Could we find a scientific way to break down why events like these that are extremely tragic and similar events that are maybe less tragic occur all the time? The researchers that really started this conversation were Bib Latine and John Darley. 
we would be in watching the video actually be introduced to John Darley as he describes some of the things that him and Latine set up in their original studies to explore this bystander effect. He talk about some questions that they asked and some ideas that sort of came about through their conversations on what could have potentially led up to the tragic death of Kitty Genovese. Eventually, he would have talked about a study that they started to run to see if they could explain one of the factors behind not only this event, but other events of the bystander effect. And this study was later called the smoke experiment. In this study, participants would come in to fill out some random survey, be placed in a room, and as they're sitting in a room filling out a survey, smoke would come billowing into the room that they were participating in. Now, in some iterations of this study, these individuals were all alone. In others, they were with a bunch of other participants, true participants this time, asked to participate in the same survey. And what Latine and Darley wanted to see was how people would react to this seemingly obvious emergency when they were either alone or when they were with others. And what they found, much to their surprise, was that not only did people in the situation when they were alone respond faster to this emergency, but more often than not, those paired with others never actually got up to respond to this emergency. Instead, they persisted in filling out the survey as smoke continued to billow into the room almost to the point where the entire room was filled with smoke. And when Latine and Darley surveyed many of the participants, what they found is that many of them reported feeling that maybe that situation wasn't as dire as it sort of looked to them, or that obviously if something was wrong, somebody else would have acted. This eventually led them to conclude that when people are in groups, an effect called pluralistic ignorance is behind a lot of factors that lead up to the bystander effect. Pluralistic ignorance being this kind of group collective mindset that becomes, as the name sort of implies, more ignorant, less able to determine what's an emergency and what's not, and what requires attention and what doesn't. And we instead sort of just become sheep going along with whatever everybody's doing, not really thinking for ourselves and recognizing what's maybe a problem. Latine and Darley suggested that this might have been a factor in not only the Kitty Genovese case, but others as well. Many people may be looking down from their windows as this woman was brutally murdered, screaming, pleading for help, might have somehow concluded when they looked at everybody else just sitting there watching that even though it looked like it could be an emergency, it maybe wasn't. Now, Latine and Darley recognized that even though this might have been a factor for some, it probably wasn't the sole factor for many. So after running this study, they went back to the drawing board to see what else could have also been at play. And this led them to create another really interesting experiment where they tried to see what people would do when there really was a clear indication that there was an emergency and a need to act, but others were around. To study this, though, and determine if people would help in that situation, they had to set up a way to prevent people from knowing if others had been there to help. So in this iteration, or this study that they ran, which is later called the seizure experiment, people were invited to come into a room, put on a set of headphones, and theoretically have a conversation about random topics with a bunch of classmates that were in different rooms wearing headphones at the same time. Now, in some versions of this experiment, people were told that they were just going to be paired up with one other individual and nobody was going to be listening in as these recordings were happening. In other versions of it, they were told they were going to be paired up with two or three or up to five individuals, if I recall correctly. They were all going to be participating and listening in on what transpired. And during each iteration of this experiment, what would happen was one of the participants, which was actually just a recording, would begin to start stressing out in the experiment and start having a seizure, start begging for help and pleading for whoever could hear them to go get help or come help them as they were going through this, this seizure and potentially going to die. And what Latine and Darley wanted to see was not only how quickly people would respond to this emergency, but if there would be a difference from session to session as to who would go help. 
And what they were able to find was that most people, when on their own, or at least led to believe that they were on their own, and almost immediately when they heard this emergency occur, get up, start running around and trying to find ways to help. But when they believed that there was another person that could potentially help this person, somebody else that was in the study, their chances of getting up started to drop. And it got to the point where when people believed there were three, four, five other individuals that could potentially help, the aggregate total percentage of time that people got up led them to conclude that actually you know, your chances of being helped were significantly worse after you got, I think, above three individuals that could potentially help than if you were just alone or with maybe two other people. They called this particular effect diffusion of responsibility. Or when people are paired with others, even when we know there's an emergency, we feel less and less inclined as the, the group gets larger to feel a need to act and to assume that it's our job to help out with this specific situation. This, in conjunction with pluralistic ignorance, Latine and Darley argued was the main forces behind this bystander effect that they discovered, well, that they, I guess, named through situations like the Kitty Genovese case or many others where, unfortunately, people conform not by acting, but by not acting in situations where action really should occur. And there's other studies that looked at topics similar to this and tried to find ways to kind of increase helping, knowing that this bystander effect was out there. And this, along with other research that, unfortunately, we don't have time to watch videos on, really spurned on a lot of conversations that still persist today on this topic of conformity and how we are so impacted by the situation around us. And hopefully from a lot of this stuff that we've covered, you know a better sense of some maybe situations in your life where you might be compelled to work towards others or do things because you're in a part of a group or maybe compelled not to act when you really should. And hopefully from this, you can be a little bit better equipped in those situations in the future. And this brings us to another really important lesson that I want us to learn in this intro class. It goes beyond just conforming to our peers or those around us. It goes into a topic that has been studied a lot by researchers for many years, but was really highlighted by a very controversial study that we'll learn about in our next class. A research topic of obedience that was looked at by a gentleman named Stanley Milgram. In our next, we'll call it a class, instead of me lecturing on this topic and the research that Milgram ran, what we're going to do is watch Milgram's very classic obedience film. While watching this film, we're going to get a background on this study, hear some of his points that he made, and with that video in conjunction with the description of it in the book, hopefully you'll get a, a more clear picture of not just how we're sometimes bent to follow the social situation, but how power and influence can greatly impact us in ways that we could never imagine. If you've done gone through that, we're going to reach the finish line for a lot of this material. So I hope you've kind of been keeping up with all of this. You're feeling good about things. And I guess since this is our last lecture before this second exam, I hope you're all feeling good about all the material that we've gone through. And I hope all of you do really well on that second exam, since I'm not going to get to say goodbye another time before you take it. So I wish you all the best. I want you to take care. And I guess I'll see you soon-ish when we get into our last section of the class. Take care, everybody.